ارجو التكرم يو كايندلي ريكويستد تو بوت يور اون موبايلز اون سايلنت مود بليز Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. His Excellency Dr. Jamal Sanad Suwed, Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, uh, welcomes you all and is proud to have this lecture entitled Afghanistan Beyond 2014. And this lecture is part of the series of lectures organized by the center hosting experts to discuss vital issues, giving the opportunity to the participants to exchange ideas on these issues. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the whole world uh, is uh, uh, waiting for the transformations to be witnessed in Afghanistan that will have its own influence on its future. Afghanistan is a country that has been always uh, witnessing upheavals as it has been witnessing the presidential, president, uh, uh, the presidential elections and the withdrawal of foreign forces that will impose upon the government uh, some military and security pressures and uh, now we are talking about the ability and the capacity of Afghanistan Afghanistan to deal with these challenges and uh, the challenges that Afghanistan will face in the future and can the Af Afghan forces uh, implement uh, the tasks uh, implemented and executed by the foreign forces in the light of the security situation and what are the possible scenarios for the future of Afghanistan beyond 2014 in the light of these expected changes. It's to be noted that there are some countries that contributed uh, and uh, very largely uh, to the stability and peace in Afghanistan uh, in order to play its own uh, role in the region, including the United Arab Emirates that has always been uh, 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 presenting and introducing development projects uh, such as the infrastructures projects, education and health uh, projects to provide better life for the people of Afghanistan and to enhance uh, stability and security and better future. It gives me the pleasure Pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Hikmat Karazai, who will uh, present uh, and discuss uh, the issue of Afghanistan beyond uh, 2014. Mr. Karazai is the founding director of the Center for Conflict and Peace Studies, uh, and uh, prior to his current position, Mr. Karazai served as an RMS fellow at the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research in Singapore, where his primary focus was on uh, South and Central Asia. Asia and Mr. Karazai is, uh, has published many papers on uh, conflict dis, uh, settlement uh, development and he is also a professor of uh, many uh, 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 curriculums in, and he's a reference and authority in the field of uh, 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 Afghanistan and also a, a, a first fellow of the uh, 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 American uh, uh, US Special Operations Command in Tampa, Florida. Mr. Karazai has uh, published many uh, studies on uh, Afghanistan, strengthening security in contemporary Afghanistan, and his works were translated into different languages. And the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University has uh, published his uh, master's degree dissertation, strengthening security in contemporary Afghanistan, coping with the Taliban. And his study on suicide uh, terrorism in Afghanistan, how to curb rising suicide terrorism in Afghanistan, was the first on the subject and was published by the Christian Science Monitor and the Straight Times in Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to invite Mr. Karazai to give his lecture on Afghanistan beyond 2014. Mr. Karazai, uh, uh, the floor is yours, please. We have the honor to invite you, and the floor is yours again. Thank you, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dr. Jamal, Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, 
colleagues from the diplomatic community and ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. Let me start by thanking the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research for the kind invitation. I am delighted to be here in Abu Dhabi. I'm delighted to be with you. And let me also take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Jamal for uh, an inspirational job of what he has done with the center. Uh, this year marks the 20th anniversary for the center. And he's an inspirational figure for people like myself, uh, especially in countries like ours, where the strategic research and the strategic and rigorous research lacks. Uh, centers like the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research is a great institution. We regularly refer to it, and we regularly uh, refer our colleagues to this institute. So it is wonderful uh, to have you as a mentor. It's wonderful to have this institute here in Abu Dhabi. As an Afghan, let me also take this opportunity to thank the United Arab Emirates for the hand that it has extended to Afghanistan. UAE has been one of the very, very few Muslim countries that has provided assistance and support to the Afghan people. And Afghans will not forget that. UAE has embarked on various different initiatives. It has built schools. It has built madrasas. And my favorite project is a training program uh, which is established by the UAE government, uh, where they're training over 20,000 religious clerics. Uh, in today's world, where our battle is one of ideology, training cleric is of utmost importance. And we sincerely thank the UAE for that. Let me also say that the UAE ambassador in Kabul uh, is a dear friend of mine. He has spent over four years in Afghanistan, uh, probably the longest serving ambassador in Afghanistan. I think he's now spent enough time to apply for an Afghan citizenship. So if he's uh, interested in citizenship. So what I want to do today is provide you an Afghan perspective. I want to be frank. Hopefully, at the end, uh, you'll be able to ask me easy questions as well. Uh, but at the same time, I would like to make sure that there's a discussion uh, between us. Uh, in particularly, I'll try to be a little provocative in certain areas, particularly when they have to deal with our Western partners and friends. But it's all in good spirit, and it's in the spirit of partnership. Uh, if one cannot be critical of our own friends, then uh, we may not necessarily be able to call ourselves friends. So with that, uh, let me briefly start. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, 2014 has become a, a very sort of difficult year for Afghans, because Afghans are starting to hear different scenarios for what will happen after 2014. Uh, there are some observations, uh, particularly from some uh, institutions, that say that immediately after 2014, uh, there will be an all-out civil war in Afghanistan. Afghans will turn on each other. They will start killing each other. And they say this because for the last three and a half decades, we have had a rather bloody history. This history started with the communist coup, then the Russian invasion. After the Russian invasion, uh, we had an internal civil conflict. After the civil conflict, we had the Taliban. Uh, for about five and a half years. And after the Taliban, we now 
have an insurgency on our hands, uh, a resilient insurgency. However, there are others like myself who are much more optimistic about the future of this country. We are optimistic because we believe that this is a test for us to see whether we can stand on our feet or not. We are also optimistic because we know that there is a younger generation uh, that sees Afghanistan, which is not the hub of international terrorism. They see an Afghanistan that is connected with the international community. They see an Afghanistan that is a healthy member and is able to contribute uh, in a positive way to the region. But in either of those two scenarios, Afghans realize that there will be challenges. There will be difficulties, uh, and those difficulties have to be addressed. However, how do we deal with those challenges? What are those challenges? And here's what I'm going to do is briefly explain those key challenges and then how to overcome those challenges. And particularly, there are three specific transitions that Afghanistan faces. The first transition is a security transition. The second one is a political transition. And the third one is an economic transition. I will try to highlight each and every one of them for you so you can have a better understanding of the dynamics that are taking place. First is the security transition. This is the transition that is receiving the most amount of attention. The reason why it's receiving the most amount of attention is because it provides the international community a legitimacy to leave Afghanistan. Right after 9-11, one of the things that happened was that the international community came to Afghanistan and looked at its priorities. What exactly is it that the international community to, should help develop? After 9-11, Afghanistan did not have a single soldier, a single policeman, or a single army officer. So the international community came together and said, let's start developing these security areas, and let's start developing specific areas so we can build institution. So they developed a concept called the lead nation concept. The lead nation concept was that one country will take over a specific sector and develop it. In this regard, the United States took the army, it provided extensive amount of resources to develop an army. The Japanese took on a, a rather large project called Demobilization, Disarmament and Reintegration, also referred to as the DDR, where the former combatants were reintegrated, uh, their weapons were taken, and they were provided with livelihood. The Germans took the police force. They wanted to train our police. They wanted to provide capacity to our police. And then the British took the anti-narcotics effort. My personal belief is, and I always tell them, that they went to the meeting late. So they ended up getting the narcotics bit. The last element which always confuses Afghans, it also confuses uh, international community, was that the Italians got our judicial sector. Now, I do not want to stipulate about how wonderful the Italian judicial sector is, but at the same time, I think a lot of questions were ra raised about this. So by 2004, slowly, we started to develop these institutions with the help of the European Union, with the help of the United States. We developed a security sector which is now about 350,000 strong. We have about 150,000 police force and about 200,000 uh, individuals in the Afghan National Army. 
Now, the plans have slowly emerged from the NATO ISAF security forces to withdraw from most of the cities in our country and in different villages and provinces and they have been slowly replaced by Afghan security forces. This was the process that was referred to as the security transition process. This process, process had five phases and on June 13th, the fifth phase of transition took place and Afghan security sector now is in charge of its own security mechanisms. However, the security sector has three very specific challenges that it needs to address. The first is that the conflict that it's facing is not a conventional warfare. It's faced with an asymmetric warfare. And the tactic or the weapon that is mostly used in Afghanistan is an IED also known as the improvised explosive device. Most of our casualties, almost 80% of our casualties come through IEDs. Now, when someone, either a car or a person is blown up in an IED, the immediate thing to do is to take them first, transport them to a hospital and then from there provide them capabilities, provide them medical treatment. Sadly, the medevac capabilities are something that we do not have. Number two, the second challenge is logistical challenge. Afghanistan is an extremely rugged and mountainous country. The ter terrain is quite difficult. So providing resources, providing ammunition to security forces, sometimes which are at a very difficult place, can be quite challenging. So logistical capabilities are the second areas. And lastly, Air Force. This is something that the country continues to struggle with and we have continuously asked our uh, international partners to see how they can assist us to make sure our security forces have air supremacy. Now, Afghans are optimistic that, that with time the security forces will stand on their feet. But at the same time, our partnership at this stage uh, seems to be in jeopardy uh, because of one particular reason, and that is the bilateral security agreement with the United States. Some of you may have heard about the bilateral security agreement, also known as the BSA. What exactly is it? And why is it receiving so much attention? I'll try to highlight it for you. After 13 and a half years in Afghanistan, the United States has expressed a desire to stay in Afghanistan and in the region to do two things. One, to provide training to the Afghan security forces, and two, conduct counterterrorism operations basically anywhere in the region. It could mean Pakistan, it could mean uh, the surrounding areas, but those are the two areas that they want to stay for. In response, the, the Afghan government and the Afghans have been asked that they are provided with nine, not one, two, but nine military facilities or military bases. If those nine military bases are provided, the United States will provide about $3.7 billion of assistance to continue, to continue uh, providing support for the Afghan security forces. At this stage, the Afghan government has decided not to sign it. Most people would say, what is wrong? Why do you not want this partnership? is providing you money, is providing you resources, and it's partnership with the world's only superpower. Some would even say, have you gone crazy? Is there a method to your madness? What exactly is it? And the argument that the president always makes is that, look, I don't think the BSA will lead to stability of our country. 
unless there's peace. So tomorrow, how will history remember me if I signed a BSA and the country went into a complete and utter chaos? The most difficult thing here is that trust and confidence between the two sides have completely evaporated. Both sides completely distrust each other. They have no confidence in each other. But at the same time, here they are in one of the most important decisions on how to move forward uh, in turning this relationship into a, a partnership. My personal belief is as follows, is that I think the United States wants to and has to stay in this region. Most importantly, this is also my understanding, is that they cannot replace Afghanistan. The United States has around 60 different bases throughout the country, but it does not have a presence in South Asia. This is the presence I think the United States is looking for. Uh, there are various hypotheses as to why they want to stay. Uh, Afghans stipulate on various of these issues, but I'm sure we can debate this uh, during our question and answer session. The second transition that I want to allude to is the political transition. And this transition really is about two things. It's about an election, and it's about having a peaceful process. It's about having a peaceful settlement. Election is extremely important. As some of you may know that on April 5th, 2014, we're having presidential elections. The current president cannot run because constitution limitations. He can only run for two terms, and he has finished his two terms. So we have 11 candidates, and within the 11 candidates, individuals from all walks of life have elected themselves. There are academics, there are professors, there are individuals who used to fight. There are individuals who are religious clerics. But it is a test of our society to see how we move forward. What is important to individuals like me is that our society is not divided between ethnic and geographic lines. I know elections are processes that divide societies on so many different lines. But one of the things that I've been go doing is to make sure that we do not divide ourselves on so many different identities. The last thing Afghanistan needs is sectarian or ethnic violence, particularly in light of what is happening in Iraq and various other countries, which is extremely unfortunate. Another one of my objectives as well is to make sure that certain segments of the society participate in the elections. I want to make sure women, and particularly the youth, the young generation, participate in this election. So it becomes part of the culture. Some of the, log the slogans that I always tell them that you need to vote or someone else will vote for you, or someone else will choose for you. So it's important that they realize that this is extremely crucial that they participate. If they do not participate, then they do not have the right to say uh, or engage in political discourse for another five years. So the first element of a political transition is to make sure that we have a successful elections that are transparent and that are acceptable to the Afghan people. We do not think that these elections are going to be elections that are held in Geneva or somewhere else. These are by Afghan standards, and we want to make sure our, our standards are, are very clear. The second element that is extremely crucial to a political transition is the peace process. And this is where I've spent almost the last five years trying to bring together the different parties, the different elements of the opposition to come and sit down and reach a political settlement. I've always believed that without a political process or without a political settlement, there is absolutely no way we can maintain the gains that we have made in the past 12 years. 
These gains range from having an enlightened constitution, having nine million children in schools, having over 30 different television stations, having you know, clinics in almost every village that can provide healthcare. But at the same time, if you have continued violence, it's very difficult to maintain those gains. But the peace process has been a long road. But nonetheless, it is a road that constantly keeps me motivating, uh, that constantly keeps me going to make sure that one day we will have a, uh, an opportunity where parents will not worry about whether their children will come back to school or not, uh, whether they will come back and there will not be a suicide attack that will kill them. In the past 13 years, I think if we look at this process, we have had various opportunities where we could have reached a political grand settlement, but sadly, we have not taken advantage of that. The first one was right after 9-11, where the Taliban were completely defeated. After their defeat, they reached out to different people, and the international community came together and hosted what was referred to as the Bonn Agreement. The Bonn Agreement was the process through which a roadmap was led, was worked out for the Afghan people. The Taliban, unfortunately, were not invited to the Bonn Agreement. The former special representative of the UN, Ladkhar Brahimi, who now is the special envoy for Syria, told me in a private conversation that it was his greatest mistake not inviting the violent opposition to the peace process, to the discussions. Then in 2002 and 2003, we had another opportunity where various of the senior commander of the Taliban sat down and said, can we talk about peace? And at that stage, the United States was not interested in peace. President Bush did not care uh, about having a peace process. His objectives were slowly, slowly drifting from Afghanistan. He had already taking, taking, taken out resources and personnel from Afghanistan. And he went to Iraq, which turned out to be the greatest disaster uh, and it's unfortunately now the people of Iraq are suffering because of that. What was one of the main reasons why the United States did not want to engage in negotiations or in peace discussions with the violent opposition? First, of course, was priority. Uh, they were more occupied with Iraq. Number two, they always thought and equated the Taliban with Al-Qaeda. They thought they were one of the same thing. Most Afghans would differ with this argument. Yes, the Taliban made a huge mistake of providing a safe sanctuary to Al-Qaeda. And for that, they paid. But there's no evidence whatsoever that alludes to the fact that the Taliban were responsible for any of the attacks against the West. There's no evidence, either on 9-11, either of the 1998 East Africa bombing, or the 2000 attack in Kol Yemen, uh, where 17 sailors were killed. So, lack of political participation, the insurgency goes across the border, starts strengthening themselves, starts to reorganize, and slowly we have a insurgency on our hand in Afghanistan. By 2006, we had an insurgency in violence in two-thirds of Afghanistan. In 2009, we almost had 90% of the country had certain levels of violence. And it was not until 2009 where the Afghans finally were able to convince the United States to say, look, this conflict does not have a military solution we need to start moving towards a political settlement. And there was then a very smart four-star general, uh, an American general by the name of Stan McChrystal said that we need to start exploring political options. 
and we started to move in that direction. We reached out to different parties, we reached out to different groups in hope that we could have a coherent strategy and plan. So in this effort, for the first time, in November of 2010, November of 2010, this date is important because this was the date where for the first time the United States sat down with the Taliban face to face, across the table, and they talked about how do we reach a political settlement. Many Afghans like myself, we were extremely hopeful to, to believe that, look, finally, we can see an end to this conflict. After various discussions, there were three things that were agreed upon. And these were all conversations that were taking place uh, in a confidence environment, confidential environment. The first decision was that the United States will provide certain segments of the leadership of the opposition. Uh, they will remove them from their blacklist. They will also remove the Taliban from the 1267 sanctions committee of the UN. The argument here is that many of these people are on the blacklist. They're considered as terrorists. So they said, if I'm considered a terrorist, how can you negotiate with me? So the first effort was, okay, let's remove these people from the blacklist. That was the first confidence building measure. The second one was that there's an American soldier who has been in the custody of the Taliban since 2009. An American soldier by the name of Bo Bergdahl. His parents are putting a lot of pressure on the US administration to say, what have you done with our son? So the second confidence building measure was that the Taliban will release Bo Bergdahl and the Americans will release about five detainees from Guantanamo Bay, the detention facility there. Agreement was reached, fine. The third element was that once these two confidence building measures are undertaken, then the Afghan government and the United States will allow the Taliban to open an office in Doha, Qatar. With time, we moved forward. Everyone agreed to these. The first confidence building measure was reached. Very senior members of the Taliban were delisted. It was positive. But the second element, where there was supposed to be a transfer of detainees, the United States was not able to do that. And there's a lot of reasons why they did not do it. They had congressional restrictions. They had two other issues. One was that within the US administration, they did not speak with one voice. There was no unified strategy on how to move forward. So, because we were stuck on the second confidence building measures, the talks were broken off, they ended. And as a consequence, on March 2012, we were informed that there were going to be no more discussions, no more talks of the peace process. And at this stage, when I realized the process, there are four specific challenges that the peace process specifically faces. First, the Afghan government and its international partners do not have a strategic vision for what the final settlement should look like. What should this process at the end of the day entail? Because there's no strategy, all of our partners do things on their own. They find it sexy to reach out to violent opposition. They think it's good to have contacts with the insurgency because they have their own interests. They want to protect their own population. One of our partners Hopefully, I mean, you can find their names, but I will not say who they are. They reached out to the Taliban, and they engaged with someone who they thought was the number two 
of the leadership. Instead, he was a shopkeeper. So a shopkeeper came, made a lot of money, and became a really wealthy businessman. And that country realized that peace negotiations and peace discussions are not very simple things. They're very complicated. You need to know who you're dealing with. So the first element is lack of a coherent strategy between our partners and the Afghans themselves. The second very serious challenge is that we have a neighbor, one of our most important and largest neighbors, called Pakistan. Unfortunately, Pakistan has not been as sincere as we would like them to be. They have not been able to deliver or they have not been able to, to provide the support that we would like. It's very unfortunate because I'm one of the individuals who's constantly criticized that I always support Pakistan. The reason why I support Pakistan is because I have lived as a refugee in Pakistan and I always make a distinction between the people of Pakistan and the government of Pakistan. The people of Pakistan are the most generous individuals that I have met. But sadly, it's the government policy that at times gets us into trouble. The reason why I say this is that whenever Afghans have established links with the insurgency, those individuals are arrested immediately. And we have various examples. The number two of the Taliban was someone by the name of Mullah Biradar. There were contacts with Mullah Biradar. And we were excited about it, that it was going to lead to a discussion. Two weeks later, he was arrested in Karachi. And he's still in the Pakistani custody. Similarly, various of our international partners have reached out to the Taliban. After their meetings, when they go back to Pakistan, they're arrested. But once again, I'm, I'm uh, hopeless or, or, or an optimist. I think that the, pres the, 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 the government of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif will be able to come through. I think there is hope in this partnership, given that they face their own challenges. Uh, they have an insurgency in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. They have a lot of challenges in, in the Balochistan areas. There's a lot of issues in Karachi. So we are sympathetic to that, but I think the long-term solution is not flirting with extremism. It's about dealing with extremism. It's about really making sure that at the end of the day, extremism does not become terrorism. The third challenge that I want to address is the challenge with the United States. And here, I've always believed that the United States did not speak with one voice when it came to the peace process or when it came to a lot of activities on the region. When we would have discussions with the United States you know, uh, Department of Defense, we would always hear the statement that we need one more year, we need more resources, we need more soldiers, and we can crush this insurgency. But when we would go to State Department, it would be something else. It would say, let's look at this opportunity, see where we can explore positive engagement, see if there's a window that we could move towards to see, to move towards the peace process. Sadly, it was this kind of disconnect between these different bodies that ended up ending uh, the channels that were built between different parties. And I think it's unfortunate that even till today, we have not been able to get the United States to speak with one vo voice on this. The last challenge that I see really is within the Taliban. And I've communicated this on various levels to them as well, that they do not see the bigger picture. Some of them believe that if we continue to fight, they will come into power. But the reality is that the Afghanistan of the 90s and the Afghanistan of today is completely different. There is an educated population. And this population, as I said before, does not want to go back to the draconian times that they enforced on the population. Thus, where are we now? Well, about a year ago, almost nine months ago, the Taliban were scheduled to open an office in Qatar. But 
unfortunately, whether it was lack of communication, or whether it was conspiracies, whatever it was, uh, we went back to square one. Whenever we take one step forward, unfortunately, there's two steps back. The Taliban opened an office on June 18th, and they did two things. One, they raised a flag, which was their traditional flag. And they had a plaque on the wall which said the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan. Those were both elements that reminded the Afghan public of what their times reminded them. So the office closed immediately, saying, is this a conspiracy against the Afghans? Are the Taliban receiving an embassy? Is it a government in exile? So at this stage, we are trying to re-establish the peace talks, and there are several channels how, at how that could be done, and we're exploring that, and I'm happy to explore that during the Q&A. This brings me to the last segment of, of the transition, which is the economic transition. Now, this is the third and the most neglected transition, not just in Afghanistan, but also in the region. Uh, if you look at Pakistan, if you look at various other countries. Now, in here, there are different di discourses. There are Western academics who believe that poverty does not, at any cost, create terrorists. They believe that if poverty created terrorists, then why do we have Ayman al-Zawahiri, who is a doctor? Why do we have Muhammad Atta, who is an engineer, came from a well-respected family? Why do we have Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? But this argument is only applicable to the leadership. This argument is not applicable to the foot soldiers. In countries like ours, where parents are not able to provide basic livelihood to children, what happens to them? At times, they're given to different madrasas, and it's the madrasas that brings them up. And it's this madrasas that eventually trains them. I personally, as a kid, went to a madrasa. I did not become uh, a brainwashed terrorist, but luckily, it, a lot has to do with how the person teaches you. Particularly, the language and specifically the ideology that the, t that the person teaches you. So, what is significant here is that we develop a strategy to make sure that the younger generation does not go to, because of unemployment, because of narcotics, or particularly because of reasons such as revenge, they pick up weapons uh, or they decide to blow themselves up. Sometimes when I try to explain to my Western colleagues that it's ideology that creates a smart bomb, it's very difficult for them to understand what a smart bomb is. And I say a smart bomb is a human being who's willing to blow themselves up. And they said, why would a person do that? And I said, I think we're, we're dealing with it's two different understandings. Uh, so how do we move forward towards an economic strategy? And here, uh, one of the things that we have worked on is an economic strategy that is based on three pillars, not just for Afghanistan, but for the region. First, if we look at Afghanistan, it is a landlocked country. So naturally, one would think that its geography, it's its greatest liability and its greatest weakness. You could go back to thousands of years. We could go back to Tamer Lane. You could go, to, go back to Alexander the Great. All of them have passed through Afghanistan. If you look at the great empires, British at one point came twice to Afghanistan. They were defeated, unfortunately, but uh, these were different wars that were fought. But that liability, that liability, in my opinion, is our greatest asset. Because we are the only country in this region that can connect 
South Asia to the Middle East and South Asia to Central Asia. Our greatest asset has always been when we become the hub of regional cooperation. If we bring these countries together, whether it's South Asian countries connecting them to Central Asia, whether it's through resources, through whatever, I think we could benefit uh, the, the enormous economic benefits that it offers. The second asset that I believe Afghanistan can deal with or has is that 67% of the population is under the age of 25. It's one of the youngest countries in the world. Having a country with such talent and resource, one needs to look at how you can utilize them. We have lots of youth who want to become political scientists, but sadly we have so many of them. We need to move them towards technical areas, towards doctors and engineers. And this transition of this older generation to this one, in my opinion, will be quite smoother. The last, the last asset that we have is, is an amazing amount of wealth uh, which comes from the minerals that we have. Not a lot of people know this, but in Afghanistan we have some of the most uh, uh, specific minerals uh, and the estimation of how much it values is somewhere between three to ten trillion dollars. We, it ranges from copper to lithium to iron and these are in the greatest supply. The sad reality is that at this stage we do not have the capacity to understand where the market is, who do we need to sell it to, how do we need to sell it. So in this regard, training our own Afghans in the technical areas will be of, of great, of great uh, asset to make sure we're able to connect with the rest of the world. So in conclusion, I think I've, I've spoken more than my time. Uh, there is hope, but at the same time, 2014 also represents a fear that what if this whole thing comes crumbling down? Uh, but at the same time, uh, with partners, particularly partners like UAE and others, I think Afghanistan will not only survive, uh, but it will transform itself uh, to, to a country that is not known for, for terrorism, but known for, for connectivity, uh, and most importantly, uh, an ability to, to, to be a bridge between the different regions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hikmet Karzai, for this very interesting lecture. And actually, you give clear uh, picture for us about uh, the current situation and also give uh, indicators for the future, how it looks like. I know there is... Uh, uh, many opportunities in the Afghanistan and it's only the times and the people that are looking for the better uh, future for Afghanistan. Now I will open the floor for the audience and uh, I want to ask them first uh, stand up, introduce yourself and ask a question, make it short as you as possible as Dr. Ahmed Al Matroshi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. <coughs> First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Hikmet for his uh, culture lecture. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, his lecture and his statement, it was deep. And myself, really, I'm uh, uh, really, I feel that I get new information about Afghanistan. I have really two questions for you, Mr. Hikmat. One of them regarding the election in Afghanistan. As you said, the candidate, they are from different level. These candidate, of course, as you are living in Afghanistan and you are near, nearest to the government, who you are thinking? will reach uh, by the end 
to, to lead Afghanistan. And the second question is regarding uh, the West country, the Western country said sometimes uh, they are facing uh, difficulty to develop Afghanistan. And there's a big stone uh, on the way of developing Afghanistan. One of them, the corruption, and the second one is the security. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, both good questions. First, if you don't mind, I'll address the second one first. Uh, it's absolutely true that there's corruption. Uh, there's several levels of corruption. Uh, and I want to make sure I provide you an understanding uh, on how do we perceive corruptions. First, there's Analyzing it, there's three different levels of corruption. The first corruption is petty corruption. It's small level corruption. This corruption comes from when you go to a particular department and you have to give small amount of money to someone to get your work done. For that, there are a lot of bureaucracy. Like all governments, I think Afghanistan has much more bureaucracy than, than a lot of other governments. So a lot of these bureaucracy in every place that you go to, you have to provide them something. That's one level of corruption. The second level of corruption is at a higher level. This is at the director level, at the deputy minister level, where, for example, if you wanted a particular project, you would have to give them money. And then uh, they'll be able to provide you that project. The third level of corruption is also corruption within our international partners and international system. Now, for both of the corruptions that are in Afghanistan, there are two different kind of solutions. For the petty corruptions, what you need to do is reform your system. Make it as such where the, you know, engagement between a person and the government entity is reduced. For example, if somebody wants to get a license in Afghanistan, there's about 30 different steps that he needs to take. So getting a license is, is a headache. So what do you do? You reform the system where you bring mechanisms where the interaction between that person and the government is reduced to two or three, and then it's the bureaucracy that deals with it. That's one. The second level of corruption is at a higher level. For that, you need political will. You need to make sure people are captured, you need to make sure people are prosecuted, and you need to make sure that people, others, learn from that. The third level corruption is corruptions that is at a very higher level, that's with our international friends, where there are contracting mechanisms, where if you're able to pay people, they can give you large contracts and there are lots of subcontracting. There are faulty mechanisms in this regard. And I think the problem here is multifaceted, and it requires an approach uh, that, that has to be dealing with all different levels. So there is corruption, I completely agree with you, but it's also important that we understand what kind of corruption it is. Security has deteriorated. Every year we have more soldiers, but casualties go up. This year, particularly, security deteriorated because the international community pulled out all the security forces from different countries. For example, uh, the ambassador will be able to tell you that the Australians had soldiers in Uruzgan province. They're no longer there. So as a consequence, a lot of the security has deteriorated because it's the Afghans fighting. Uh, we do not have the sophisticated capabilities that the foreign soldiers had, but still, that's one of the main reasons why security has de de uh, deteriorated. Who will become the next president or who will win? Honestly, I wish I knew. Uh, I wish I knew because so I could support him as well uh, and not go through all these difficult problems. Uh, 
my advice to, to all my colleagues and all the people that, that sort of I have relationship with, that there are candidates that are running on particular platform. There are candidates who are running on religious basis. My advice really to them is very simple. The only person that we're going to vote for we have to see what kind of agenda they have for Afghanistan and whether him and his team will be able to implement that agenda. So we're not going to vote on ethnic lines. We're not going to vote on religious lines, although 99% of the population are, are, are Muslims. But we're not going to divide ourselves in this regard. It's really about agenda. It's really about what is it that they offer to the Afghan population. It's a very difficult time, and, and I don't know uh, how they want to be the president on, on such difficult circumstances because it's a huge responsibility. So, so who will who'll become the president? The campaign started yesterday. As soon as I go back, we'll have meetings with all the candidates and start hearing about their plans. So, thank you. Uh, but uh, if I ask you a question, sure. uh, Mr. Hikmet, about who is mo most l l lucky to win? You know there is many candidates. Yeah. There, there are four, four candidates that are quite popular. And I'll start with all, f I'll start uh, giving you information about all four of them. First is Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, uh, who is the former foreign minister. Uh, was uh, extremely well dressed and quite posh uh, uh, candidate. Uh, a lot of people think that he's, he's, he's quite charismatic in, in his appeal to the public. Uh, most importantly, uh, he has support in the north and specifically certain parts of the western country, uh, western part of the country. Uh, he also was a runner up last time, received 28% of the votes. The second candidate who is also extremely popular uh, is Dr. Ashraf Ghani. He uh, is a professor, has taught at Columbia University, has taught at Chicago University, has worked at the World Bank. He was a former finance minister, uh, was the chairman of the Transition Commission. Uh, so extremely popular as well, uh, extremely popular with academics and uh, the urban population. The third candidate is an individual by the name of Zalmay Rasul. He was also a foreign minister, uh, very loyal to the establishment. Uh, some people even speculate that he is the candidate of the current administration. Uh, and then there is the fourth candidate who is Kayum Karzai, uh, brother of the president. Uh, and some speculate that he has a very popular support in the south where he's from. So those are the four key candidates that I think people are betting on that out of these four, one will win. Uh, who amongst these fours, I don't have a crystal ball to look and tell you who will win. <laughs> uh, honestly, I have not made up my mind. I have not, I have not made a decision. So once I go back, then I'll have, I'll have uh, clarity. Uh, Your Excellency. Pablo Kung, the Australian Ambassador to the UAE, thank you very much, Mr. Karzai, for your lecture. And uh, I guess I'm from a country that uh, has invested, uh, along with a lot of the other Western countries you mentioned, a lot in Afghanistan over the past decade or so, and obviously we've paid the price for some of that. Uh, you mentioned Uruzgan, and uh, of course in Australia there's been a long debate about, uh, a political debate about how long uh, to remain in Afghanistan. And uh, so I guess that decision uh, has now been made, although I think we'll still have some forces there post-2014. But I had, um, I had two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, you referred to the lack of a coherent strategy amongst both the Afghan government and international partners on the peace process. And President Karzai has, has said that he wants to see more progress on the peace process before he will commit to signing a BSA. Um, but a lot of observers are just not quite sure what he means by that and what kind of progress uh, is he actually looking for and is there a coherent strategy uh, as you implied there, there may not be. 
uh, to get to that point. Um, the second question was just about the elections. Uh, of course, as you know, the, the 11 candidates, uh, do you think it's inevitable at some point there'll be a consolidation of those candidates in exchange perhaps for uh, a kind of unity government uh, post the elections? Thanks. First, uh, let me also, uh, because I've, I've visited Uruzgan uh, several times in the past, I think, nine years, uh, I've seen what the Australians, special forces, and I've seen what the OS8 is able to do. Uh, I was unbelievably impressed, uh, in particularly what they were doing. Uh, there were two countries that were providing the support or dealing with the PRT, Provincial Reconstruction Team which was the Dutch and the Australians. The people in Uruzgan loved the Australians and they did not like the Dutch. When you would ask them why, what's the problem, they said, oh, the Dutch unfortunately are, are sort of, you know, I quote them, it's not me, they said, oh, they're cunning. They, they come and they say we have 200 projects, but the 200 projects, it's like creating small water, uh, you know, uh, small, you know, water uh, canals and things like that. But when we talk to the Australians, they're very honest, they're frank with us. Uh, they don't try to create differences amongst us. So, as an Afghan, let me thank you as well for, for the support that you have provided to Afghanistan. We, I know the sacrifices and uh, the soldiers that have died have not died in vain. They have improved the lives of the people there. You asked, what is the strategy that he's looking for? You know, me, someone looking at the outside and trying to read uh, what's going on. I think a lot of it at first, as I mentioned, it's about lack of communication. It's about the ability of not being able to contribute or able to relate to one another. For example, one of the questions that I have heard the president ask many times, and he said, look, is the United States a partner with us, or is it not a partner? If it's a partner, then why is the United States bombing our villages? The United States former Army Chief of Staff was Mike Mullen. He was asked in Congress, he says, how many Al-Qaeda do you think are in Afghanistan? And his estimate was somewhere between 75 to 100. So if there's about 100 Al-Qaeda and they have moved on to Syria, they are in the Fatah region, then why are we bombing civilian and why are we bombing Afghan villages? Why are we not going to the sanctuaries where they are? That's sort of the question that he's asking for. And second, he says, I don't want this process to be completed. He says, I want the process started. Because he believes that there are a lot of conspiracies against him, I mean, I don't know if you recently have followed the news, Secretary Gates' new book is called Duty, Memoir of a Secretary of War. In that, it says that the US administration was directly undermining the president in the last election and wanted him to lose. So when you have someone with these kind of grievances, it's kind of difficult to expect anything else uh, but this kind of behavior. I think that was both of your questions. Consolidation. Consolidation, ah. In most elections, most elections, I think, if you compare elections, I went to school in the United States, there, there, there are primaries and then there are elections that, that take place. I think we have not gone through our primary. In the next few weeks, you will see most likely that the 11 candidates that we have will most likely become five or six. There are several individuals, for example, in my own province of Kandahar, we have four candidates. So all of us got together and says, either we're not voting for any one of them or they have to become one. So these are the kind of decisions that are being made at the local level that I think most likely you will have significant consolidation where we will go from 11 to most likely five or six. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, please. Speaking Arabic. 
Zeitpunkt. Good evening. My name is Jasim from the uh, Emirates uh, uh, Center for Strategic Studies and Research. Thank you for your lecture. I wanted Your Excellency to tell us something about the UAE assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, you referred to it in your own presentation, whether in the past or in the future. What effect did it leave on the Afghan community? I've heard, for example, that uh, uh, the first university was built by the late Sheikh Zayed, and there was a project of building 3,000 houses uh, to be built by UAE, and there are even uh, uh, some uh, uh, imams or Masjid Imams to be prepared and educated by UAE. Please tell us something about this point. Elaborate, please. Initially, when the international community engaged in Afghanistan, I was really optimistic that we will have lots of other Muslim countries come and participate in the reconstruction. I was particularly uh, interested to see which Arab countries would come to Afghanistan. Uh, in specific, uh, I wanted to see what Saudi would do, I wanted to see what the Qataris would do, uh, but sadly I was very disappointed. Uh, they have hardly contributed in the manner that Afghans expected them. Now, we could argue on how the conflict is analyzed, not just in Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan. Let us briefly go to history, very briefly. I'll come to UAE, but I want to set the stage first. In 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. And when they invaded Afghanistan, this was during the Cold War. So you had two different sides. Afghanistan had not taken a side. But when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, there are several theses on why Afghanistan was invaded. Some say it was, you know, to reach the Indian Ocean, warm water ports, some say they wanted to invest uh, in Afghanistan because there were lots of communist regimes uh, that had come to power in, in Afghanistan there was a communist regime so they wanted to protect their investment. Others say that it was a, uh, an attempt to take over the region after Afghanistan it was Pakistan, so various reasons. But how did they respond to this occupation in Afghanistan? The United States said there's a Muslim country that has been occupied by a former, you know, a superpower. What we need to do is turn this conflict into a religious conflict. How do we do that? Well, the conflict is not our conflict, but we lost in Vietnam and we got a bloody nose. So what we need to do is try to give the Russian their own bloody nose in Afghanistan. So. Brzezinski wrote a, a memo to President Carter and President Carter was told that this is our opportunity to give or pay back the Russians. So they said every dollar that we contribute to the engagement or to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the Saudi will match it dollar per dollar. Out of that money, that money was divided between different parties. Sheikh Abdul Azam, a Palestinian, came and participated in jihad, bin Laden. But at the same time, there were a lot of madrasas that were created. And the Saudis funded madrasas that were of typical of specific ideology. And I think all of us are aware of which ideology that was. Those madrasas started to create individuals. And those individuals were told that, look, this is an infidel empire that we're fighting. So people continue to believe that this is a, an occupation and jihad is our obligation. So thousands of people were trained. 
And the remains of those people were left. Once the United States left Afghanistan, uh, once the, the former Soviet Union left Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan were left on their own. Hundreds of those madrasas that were in Pakistan and there were parts of in Afghanistan stayed there. And they continued to brainwash those people. Then comes 9-11. People had realized the damage that was done. Thousands of people were brainwashed. Thousands of people were killed. What was the recipe or what was the strategy that they had to do or undo what they did? Sadly, this generation that I belong to have not seen what they were responsible for. That's the unfortunate part. And this is what I was hoping for, that they would come in and start building infrastructure start developing religious institutions. It's only now, after 13 years, they're building one mosque, which is great, which is wonderful. But compare that to what UAE has done. They have built, they're in the process of building an 80-kilometer road uh, from Sangin to Gajaki in Helmand province, which is one of the most uh, poorest areas. They have security personnel providing security in the south. They have built one of the most respected universities in Khos province, University uh, Sheikh Zayed universities. They have built several hundred apartments and houses in the Kasaba area for poor individuals. The latest program is where they are training 20,000 clerics out of those 20,000, several thousand will be women. They're training all of that. Each of these initiatives has a huge impact on the lives of people. At the end of the day, it's really about what kind of impact are you having on the lives of these people? And you can see visibly that this engagement uh, specifically is, is, is changing lives. I was one of the advocates because UAE has been such an uh, active player. I was hoping that actually that they could facilitate the peace process. They could be one of the venues for the peace process. I advocated for that. Uh, and there are still options because people failed in Qatar. The two options that they're suggesting now is uh, UAE and, uh, and, uh, and Turkey. So, once again, I think the, 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 the amount of work uh, the UAE government has done, and particularly the Red Crescent Society, uh, it's quite remarkable, and, and, and most Afghans understand what they've been able to do. So, it's visible impact. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, uh Sir, I am Rashid from Embassy of Pakistan. First of all, allow me to humbly contest your comment about your neighbor, that is Pakistan. Unfortunately, same sentiments prevail on this side of the border too. We'll not have a discussion on that. I have two questions for you. First is, the out of four important candidates who in your eye are uh, the likely presidents of Afghanistan in future, who has more acceptability for Taliban and the major forces of Taliban? And my second question is, in a scenario where U.S. stays beyond 2014 in Afghanistan, what you see as the future of insurgency in Afghanistan? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rashid. I'm glad you did not ask me a specific question on, on, on Pak-Afghan relations because we would have, let's just say that we agree to disagree on certain issues, but I still have lots of admiration for your people. Uh, elections and what's the most favorable candidate for the Taliban? I think you should ask the Taliban that question. Right? Yeah. Uh, Two, in the case there's insurgency and in case the U.S. stays after 2011, 
after 2014, what will happen. I think we go back to what the President of Afghanistan has said. If there's no peace in Afghanistan, what good is the BSA? If the United States comes and takes nine bases and says that what happens in Afghanistan and in this Pakistan, then it's your business. We are comfortable on our nine bases. Then to the Afghan public, what good is this BSA? It could not give four billion dollars, it could give ten billion dollars. But if Afghan villages are bombed, Afghan civilians are killed, and there is continued tension between Afghanistan and Pakistan, then what good is the BSA? So, if the United States is going to stay, we need to make sure that there is a political consensus. We need to make sure that the Taliban are brought in specifically to the negotiation tables, negotiation table through the Pakistani side, negotiations through the American side, and we reach an understanding. If there's no peace and we have a strategic partnership with the United States, I think it's going to be a disaster for Afghanistan. And the Afghan public are just not willing to pay the price for that. Even though there's an amazing amount of pressure at this stage on all Afghans, because we are almost taught to be scared and be almost worry that 2014 has come is coming and you're going to die. But, you know, we have a saying that dignity and, you know, survival is in the hands of the Almighty. So, so we live a difficult life. It's, it's, not that bad. it's not that bad. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, can you stand up? Uh, can you open it, uh, the mic? Turn it on. It's off. Thank you. Admiral Akrut, uh, Defense uh, Attaché from Tunisia here in the UAE. My question, Mr. Karazai, is a continuation of Mr. Rashid's uh, question. Is that, do you share the conviction of considering uh, Afghanistan as a water law of uh, the NATO counterinsurgency and counterterrorism strategies and some things that this is due to two factors. The first one is the conspiration, conspiracy spirit and the lack of confidence in the Afghanis and the in the neighboring countries, and second, that the Afghani consider this war as a religious war. Thank you. I'm sorry, I did not get your country. Which country? Tunisia. Tunisia, okay, so, thank you. Uh, NATO and counterinsurgency. Uh, I, I'm, I consider myself a, a student of counterinsurgency. I've studied counterinsurgency extensively and I've, I've taught counterinsurgency. One of the most basic principles of counterinsurgency, uh, to use Clausewitz, which is a different kind of war, is that the center of gravity of counterinsurgency is population. So when you're fighting counterinsurgency, you have to know the population, who they are, what do they like, what do they not like, uh, what kind of religion are they, what are their characteristics. Sadly, in Afghanistan, the most basic principles of counterinsurgency were, were not respected. Clearly, there were some countries that had their own doctrine, uh, but at the same time, in most, you know, and Dr. Jamal and I had this conversation, I think it's very difficult to have a soldier that come from the outside, 
that comes into a very complex society for them to understand the local realities or what the local culture represents. Uh, I've had various discussions with my Western colleagues about this, about, look, why do you not do a better job at preparing yourself? You know, for example, I always explain to them that in Afghanistan, Islam is not just a religion. Islam is a way of life. What does this statement tell you? To a Muslim, it means one thing. To a Westerner, it could hardly mean anything. It would mean that you would learn about Islam. It would mean that you would appreciate the fundamentals of Islam so you do not violate them. But there are many instances in Afghanistan where the Holy Quran was burned. And Afghans were watching when the Holy Qurans were burned. So we had massive riots, massive protests. And Americans were killed because of that. Why was that? Is it because of ignorance or is it because you don't do your homework? You know, when we talk about relationship with the West, I'm one of the biggest advocates for having a relationship with the West. I say that because of the relationship, because of what we're able to do with each other, we can provide that partnership. But again, all my colleagues, and particularly the elders, ask me that, at what cost do we want this partnership? No. So, have they succeeded? I personally don't think so, because I think we still have violence, we still have a huge amount of, you know, uh, insecurity in the country, and that's not just the fault on the Westerners, it's also the fault of the Afghans. They have not been able to, to, to bring about the, the, the security they desire. You mentioned that, does Afghan, do Afghans consider this a religious war? Afghans as a general collectively do not consider this as a religious war, but the Taliban considered it as a religious war. And the argument is that Afghanistan has become an occupation because what's the difference between the former Soviet Union coming into Afghanistan and invading and now the United States has come to Afghanistan and it's an invader. That's the crux of the argument. For people like us, we try to sort of wash this and we try to give it a lot of face job and things like that to say they're our partners, they're here to assist, look at all, they're not just Westerners, they're Muslim countries who are here to help. But they say no, this is jihad. So this is where we really need to start having a dialogue between Islam and the West. Is this really, how do we define occupation? How do you define jihad? So there are a lot of important issues and I think, especially as Muslims, this is our responsibility to, do, to identify this. There are a lot of Muslim countries which have Western forces, Saudi Arabia, which has two of the most important sites in Islam, the Holy Kaaba and Medina Sharif, had Americans. Why was jihad not obligatory then? Why is jihad only obligatory when it comes to Afghanistan? I mean, we could discuss this for, for hours and hours. Thank you. Yes, here in the middle. <coughs> Yes. Yes, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, my name is Ahmed Shikara and ECSSR. Uh, my question is to you like this. Um, you spoke about uh, basically, thank you for your lecture and for your insightful lecture, really very important uh, data and information. Uh, my question is like this. We speak always about personalities and the importance of Karazai or Obama or other people, but I want to know exactly what, how decision making is being done in Afghanistan itself, particularly as you spoke about the importance of the political transition to democracy or 
to stability and you know progress in that direction. Who is taking the decision in the final analysis? Is it Karazai himself? Is the lawyer Jerka important? Uh, what about the regional countries' import, you know, influence, like for example uh, Iran, uh, uh, also uh, India? Plus, uh, you spoke about the trillion, ten trillion dollars uh, value of minerals potential, which is very, very important. Uh, how, is, uh, how do you think? What is the roadmap for that? Uh, we hear in news that India and China is taking a great uh, stake in that. Is that an analysis? Also, what is the uh, question of the nar narcotics? What is the value of narcotics now? Is it still going on in a very high uh, pace, or what? Thank you very much. That's a thesis, actually. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to sum it up, and then we can have a side discussion, because it's, it's an important question, and it's really a wonderful question. How are decisions made, uh, particularly at a, at a political level and also at, at the social level? I think one of the, one of the paramount ideas that uh, people in the West forget that the idea of democracy or the idea of collective decision making uh, has originated from eastern part of the world. For example, of the days of the Holy Prophet, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away, there was a collective decision to have the next Khalifa. Uh, be appointed. And in Islam, there's a particular verse which says, Wa amrahum shura bainahum. Sit amongst yourself and consult. Particularly if you look at that context now in Afghanistan, we've always been a very conservative and very traditional society. We've been a tribal society. Decisions were always made at the local level. So when we say in IR or international politics where all politics is local, we really define that because it, it happens at the village level. It happens at the smallest micro uh, level. Decisions at the micro levels are really made by local elders, by tribal elders. These are elders that have, for centuries, have made decisions. But however, there's this dichotomy now in terms of the changing times. Because at one time, you have an informal system and then there's a formal system of governance. The informal system of governance is that you have religious elders, tribal elders all getting together, forming a shura. And then the shura makes a decision on a particular issue. Could be death, could be anything. And once that decision is given, then it's a decision. Similarly, I think you see this in Yemen, you see this in Pakistan, you see this in so many other countries. But now there's this modern understanding of governance where there's a particular set of doing things. Sadly, one of the things that happened in the United, in Afghanistan is that when the international community came, they did not realize that there was already a mechanisms that made decisions. So they tried to enforce a Jeffersonian system, which did not really apply to people. So we were between two systems. There was the informal system, which in certain cases was working, in other cases, no. And then there were the formal systems. So decisions now are made by, by on several levels. It really depends on what the issue is about. If it's at the local level, they, you have local government, you have local tribal elders. Uh, sadly, one of the things that has also happened is, and this also has to do with the, this post Cold War environment is where a lot of the leadership went from tribal to religious leaders. And depending on what kind of relationship you had, that's the kind of ideology, religious ideology you had. So if you came sort of with Diobandi ideology, you had one kind of belief, but if you had a sort of Wahhabi ideology, there was a different belief. At the grand level, it definitely is not China, it definitely is not India that's making decisions. Uh, now, if India was making decisions, that would drive the Pakistanis crazy wouldn't it? Uh, so, but India's presence is always uh, a huge, huge element uh, with Pakistan. 
this relationship between India and Pakistan is directly impacting us. Uh, the, the relationship between Saudi and Iran is directly impacting us. So our decisions we try to, and also, I mean, the relationship between the United States and Iran is directly impacting us. The Sunni-Shia element is directly impacting us. So we are, sometimes I refer to it as the theme park of conflict, because we don't have one conflict, we have so many other people's conflict and that's being played out in Afghanistan. But uh, for better or worse, we now have a system that's slowly making its own decisions. I mean, now, imagine a country like Afghanistan standing up to the United States and saying, no, I'm not going to sign this BSA. What makes you think that we don't make our own decisions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karazai. You mentioned that the decision is made in local level, but the issues is related for the, to the security. How, the, how, how did they make a decision and uh, how it's been taken? And what is the, uh, the cooperation between the central uh, government and the local governments? Sure. Especially the issue is related now the negotiated you mean and bilateral security agreement yes. or just the security no, no. in general? Uh, security general and bilateral, especially mm. the bilateral agreement with the United States, how they, they, they will deal with it if the decision is taken in the local level. Hmm. About a year and a half ago, the Afghan government signed an agreement called Strategic Partnership with the United States. This strategic partnership had a clause uh, which said that a year from signing this strategic partnership, uh, the Afghan government and the United States will sign a bilateral security agreement. And this is supposed to be the technical agreement between the two countries. So, how the decisions were made was both of the countries had a team that came, sat down, and worked out the different ideas. Once that agreement was finished, it was brought to the Afghan government, and the Afghan government brought it to Aloy Jirga. Aloy Jirga is a combination of tribal elders and traditional elders that came in, and they said, this is something that's in the interest of the Afghan people. Uh, and they verified it, and they said, this is something we want. Uh, but at the same time, the ultimate body uh, is the president. If the president says, I'm not going to sign it, he's, he's not going to sign it. So at the, end of the, at the end of the day, it's the president that, that puts a stamp on it or not. Yes. Yes, we will give a chance for at least one lady she wants to ask. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amna Khishki and I'm a journalist over here. I have three specific questions. Oh. Number one, like when we were talking about a different presidential candidate, I wish, I want to know about the role of women beyond 2014. And I wish, I want to see one of the names uh, like from the woman's side. From, like, I'm sure Afghani women are very strong enough to be a president in this country. Number two, uh, you know, uh, when you talk about the beyond 2014, and you know, we know Afghanistan has a great civilization. Don't you think it's a time to rebrand the country and to give the, the right picture of the country to the rest of the world? So we could think, beyond, like, uh, we should not uh, say uh, supplement power, complement Afghanistan with only war. It's a great civilization, it's a great tradition over there. And I think it's a time to rebrand the whole country. Number three, uh, when you talk about your lesson, the Afghanistan lesson with the Taliban talks, how will you, what, what's it's your assessment and evaluation when it comes to Pakistan and Taliban talks? How, what are the sessions you want to give to Pakistan? Thank you. Oh. I think I'll, I'll start with the easy one, which is the talk between Taliban and Pakistan. Um, <clears throat> I think we've always, we've always supported that. Uh, we've always said that I think the conflict uh, requires a political uh, settlement. Uh, and it's, I, I was quite shocked and amazed that the Taliban suggested that they should have Imran Khan or their team. That's, that's quite amazing to see how much goodwill he has. Uh, and he has stood up for certain beliefs. 
uh, there. But I think whether it will succeed or not, I don't know, because I think the people that Pakistan has selected to represent them, themselves are Taliban. Uh, so I'm not sure. I mean, many of those people that I know, uh, and I've interacted with them, uh, for them to represent the Pakistani government is questionable, but we'll see. So, uh, role of women in the post-2014 world. Uh, I think if we have made one achievement, uh, specifically, uh, it's specific, it's in making sure that the rights of women are not uh, violated in specific area or are made concession of. So, for example, when we had discussions on the peace talks, I made a suggestion that we should go into peace talks without any preconditions. But once there are discussions, we can absolutely not negotiate on women's rights or territorial integrity. So, I made this argument on two things. One, of course, if you look at our religion, our religion provides women sufficient amount of rights. Uh, there's a hadith of the Holy Prophet which says that you know, education is compulsory for both boys and girls. Obligatory. The Prophet's first wife was a merchant. The sad reality is that at times we forget what Islam teaches us and what culture teaches us. We confuse the two. And I think moving through what Islam teaches us is, is the best way. And we have vice president candidates who are women. We have 28% of women in the Afghan parliament, 28%, which is larger than most European countries. Uh, we have women ministers. We have women deputy ministers. Uh, women, women play a, an extremely critical role in the civil society, which is quite vibrant in Afghanistan. Uh, and at least most Afghans will tell you that they're not going to jeopardize these rights uh, for anything. Uh, and I think it will only go from strength to strength. The right picture of Afghanistan, uh, I think I'm trying to do that, to provide you the right picture, uh, which is that you know, it's not a country which, you know, where you come to Afghanistan where you will start seeing suicide bombings and you will start seeing, you know, the likes of individuals with big beards and machetes and things like that. This is sort of a stereotypical mentality. Uh, Afghanistan is a country which very rich civilization, uh, which has contributed so much to the region. Uh, but unfortunately, because various of the attacks of the modern times have taken place from Afghanistan. Uh, things have changed. Now, until today, I challenge one person uh, to tell me that there was an Afghan who was involved in international terrorist attack. One Afghan. This, I, I would ask anyone, just name one Afghan that was involved in one international terrorist attack. So, so it's very difficult, and, and one of the things that we're trying to do is to provide a, a perspective that's, you know, we want to live a normal life. We want to, we want to be part of a, a normal world. Uh, but unfortunately, my generation has been a generation of war, and the constant questions that we are asked is, as in Afghanistan, you know, that's, that's completely, completely seen in a different perspective. So hopefully this younger generation will change that, and I think with time, people will understand that the, the different circumstances that have arisen, and we will take our responsibilities on our own shoulder. Yes, please. Ali Muhammad, Middle East, Abu Dhabi, Taalim. My, my question, just a moment, just a moment, please. Please introduce yourself again. 
Ali Mohammed, uh, Abu Dhabi Education Council, while talking about the British invasion of your country, you said that unfortunately the British were defeated as if those who fought them were not good people, uh, according to you. And when you talked about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, you mentioned uh, uh, and said that the Afghans were jihadis or mujahideen, according to you. And when you talked about the American invasion, you said that they were terrorists. And so, can you call your people, I mean the Afghans, according to the category of the invaders or according to the character of the fighters of the Afghan people. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, very difficult question. When I was in the US, there was an expression that I heard a lot, which said that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. I think we also have similar expression as to what that means. How do we categorize this? I'll give you a small example, and this is important to, to rationalize. <clears throat> Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat was considered a terrorist, but he addressed the UN General Assembly. Menagam Began, the sixth prime minister of Israel, was part of a terrorist group that blew up the King David Hotel, which killed 140 people. He became the Prime Minister of Israel, one of the most respected Prime Ministers. Similarly, the recently passed away Nelson Mandela was considered a terrorist. Which brings me to an argument that a friend of mine always makes. Uh, yesterday's terrorists are today's freedom fighters. Today's freedom fighters are tomorrow's terrorists. Now, I'll give you a live example. The example is this. <clears throat> 20 years back, the, Al the Afghan delegation, which consisted six very prominent personalities, went to the United States. And their host was none other than President Reagan. President Reagan, you know, here you have Afghans with like big turbans, henna colored hair, beard, you know. And they met with President Reagan. And the delegation that was led from the Afghan side was led by someone by the name of Maulawi Khalis. Maulawi Khalis was a traditional, very charismatic figure. By then, he was quite old, but he was one of the, the key mujahideen who was responsible for the defeat of the Soviet Union. So meeting with President Reagan, you know what was the first thing he told President Reagan? He told, Mr. Reagan, he told President Reagan, he said, Mr. Reagan, we like you, you're such a good man. We have a gift for you. Reagan said, what's the gift? He said, we want you to become Muslim. We feel bad that you will go to hell. And Reagan said, thank you so much. It's very kind of you. And then he said, uh, do you have a dollar? And the guy got insulted. He said, why would I have a dollar? He says, so President Reagan asked a secret service, he said, hey, bring me an American dollar. And he brought the dollar and he showed it to Molly Khalis and it said, look, it says, in God we trust which means that you and I are both on the same side fighting the infidels against the former Soviet Union. Reagan came outside and gave this massive press conference and said, look, look at these people. These are the Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin of Afghanistan. These are the people who are going to liberate their country from tyranny and the dark empire. So Moli Khalis came out. Fast forward 15 years, the United States comes to Afghanistan. Guess who's the first person who declares jihad on the United States? Moli Khalis. The same guy who was the founding father of Afghanistan declares jihad on the United States. So dynamics change, circumstances change. 
I can't categorize it more than that. It's very simple. It's really about circumstances. But one thing that I can honestly assure you is that Afghanistan will never be subject to any kind of occupation. I mean, it's quite visible in terms of our relationship with partners and countries that we have. You can't subjugate, you know, an entire country. I mean, if that was the case, then why would we stand up to the United States and say, absolutely no, we're not going to give you this? And people are surprised and shocked. So to us, it's about, you know, sovereignty, and sovereignty is extremely important as a nation to us. That's why we're one of the very few countries, very few countries that can say, even through the pr British rule, through Western colonialism, that we have never been occupied. Our entire region was occupied and colonized. Look at India, look at Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan did not exist back then, but this region belonged to the British Empire. But it's our dignity, it's our stubbornness that makes us who we are. Thank you. Wow. People don't want to go home, huh? Hmm. <laughs> they are interesting of the lecture. Good evening. Uh, yes. Today, first of all, I'm very glad because I'm Can you introduce yourself? My name is Ahmed. Yes, I'm Ahmed from, from where, India. Ahmed? Today, I'm very glad because first time I'm uh, seeing Afghanistan. From where, Ahmed? You are from where? <laughs> you are glad. I know you are glad and everyone is glad. He's glad to see you. Yes. <laughs> Hello. But tell us from where you are. I'm from India. Okay. Which institute you are working here in the United Here I'm working for white aluminium. Okay. Okay. Go Today, ahead, please. I'm very glad because this is first time I'm seeing Afghanistan intellectual so close. And my question is, if U.S. leaves, uh, U.S. and its allies leave Afghanistan, what do you think the people or group who are engaged fighting against them Will they move to Indian borders? Will they move to Kashmir? What's your opinion on that? Hmm. Ahmed, I have a very short answer for you. The U.S. is not leaving. <laughs> Habibi, it's not going anywhere. That's why it has five different deadlines. It said, oh, we need the BSA signed by October. Absolutely. No October, we're leaving. We're going to pack our bags. Get out. October came, October left. Then said, absolutely, finally, November. No November, you will see. We're serious, 100%. November came, November left. Agya <laughs> chalagya. Then, December. Also, December also came. Kaini jara. It's not going anywhere. It wants to stay. The problem is it has to deal with the president. So the solution is only two more months. Wait out this president. And then from there, whoever comes in, they will sign this immediately. So I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Yes, the last question for the, yes, for the person in the back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum assalam. You will ask in Arabic? Yes, yes, in Arabic. Abdul Samad Muhammad, an Afghan merchant living in UAE. My question to Mr. Hikmat Karazai. Since the elections are decided to be held without signing the agreement uh, with the U.S., is it possible to sign this agreement before the elections or after the elections or by the end of this year? It is said that the second question, the second question is uh, the candidate for the presidency, uh, presidency is Zalmay Rasul. Is it true? Uh, the third question, if President Karzai doesn't want to sign the agreement, why did he call the lawyer Jerg uh, and uh, to meet and spend millions of money and close Kabul for one week? Why did he ask them to come. Thank you.
All very important question, but I should tell the, my Afghan colleague that he should start investing and in coming back to Afghanistan and start investing there as well. Uh, hopefully you'll make money there as well, inshallah. Will the elections be held without the BSA or can the BSA be signed before the elections? Uh, these are all, both of them are possible, absolutely, yes. Uh, the elections will absolutely have to be held uh, and that may not have much to do with the BSA. But can the BSA be signed before the election? Uh, I think there are certain conditions. I think if they are met, then absolutely, yes, the BSA can be signed. That's one. You asked whether Zalmay Rasul was a candidate. Yes, Zalmay Rasul is a candidate. He's one of the most popular candidates amongst the four. He's one of the popular candidates. Uh, and then why was the Jirga held if you're not going to sign it? I think that's a question, uh, I think probably that the president can answer, but I can try to give you some understanding. I think Jirgas are the traditional conflict-solving mechanisms of Afghanistan. Most important decisions that are held throughout the history of Afghanistan, uh, whether it was the presidency or the constitution, there was always been uh, brought about. The decision, the final decisions were made by the Jirga. In this regard, I think the Afghan people specifically told the United States, told the Afghan government, and told the rest of the world that they want partnership with the United States. Now, in the same partnership, there were certain things that were listed that a lot of people do not listen to. For example, they said the United States should release our 18 prisoners from Guantanamo Bay. We have 18 individuals that are there. They should be released, but no one listened to that. They also said that the United States needs to stop bombing Afghan civilian and Afghan villages and houses. No one is listening to that. So we can't really look at one side of things and not look at the other. We have to make sure that we are fair on both sides. Yes, the Afghan people want this, as I said. Overwhelming majority, I would say over 80% of the Afghan people want this partnership. At the end of the day, at what cost? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, this is a wrap up our event for tonight. Uh, Finally, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, 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 on your own behalf Mr. Hikmat Karazai for his uh, uh, great uh, presentation and ideas about the future of Afghanistan uh, after beyond 2014. My thanks also go to all of you for your own uh, interactions and comments. Wishing to see you again on the settlement of disputes uh, uh, to to be presented by uh, uh, the former uh, Finnish president, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, laureate, uh, uh, at 7.30 on the 19th of February 2014. Wishing you all the best and good night. Thank you.